But, um, so hi everybody, I guess we'll just get going. Uh, my name's Megan and I'm just going to read um, a land acknowledgement, which we're trying to make a standard practice at, at our events and also update you all on um, upcoming events for the next couple months, which is gonna be great. Um, so Heidi actually was the one that wrote this land acknowledgement and it's a little more in depth. We'll probably go with a, a shorter version in the future, but this is nice because it gives some, some nice background to why we do it. So for those of us new to the practice of a land acknowledgement, this is a formal statement recited at the start of a group meeting or public event recognizing indigenous people as traditional stewards of the land we're on and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Expressing gratitude to the land has always been an indigenous custom at gatherings and has now become a more globally used practice starting in Canada and then picked up here in the US. We developed this particular land acknowledgement from several sources, including a land acknowledgement statement developed by the Gila Resources Information Project and approved by Fort Sill Apache Tribe and the local Chiricahua Apache Nation representatives, as well as historical information developed for a, a Trail of the Mountain Spirits brochure about the Apache. Because we believe that land acknowledgements are important to healing relationships as we work together to restore habitats for birds, wildlife, and the people who live here, We'd like to acknowledge that we are gathering here this evening on the occupied homelands of the Chiricahua and Warm Springs Apache. Before Anglo settlers came to this area, four band groups of Chiricahua people lived a, a mobile way of life in territory that now expands over five states and two nations. Mangus, Colorados and Geronimo were Apache leaders who called this Gila region home. By 1885, Spanish and American settlers, backed by their governments, drove most Chiricahua Apache from this area to reservations through violent displacement and broken promises. And so we would like to pay our respects to the Apache people and all Native elders, past and present. In Apache creation stories, the Chiricahua believe that they, animals and plants, all shared and spoke the same language a culture in perfect harmony with its homeland. When we consider the work being done in Audubon's name to address habitat loss, we want to recognize that we, envir that we environmental stewardship is not a new invention. We just weren't paying attention to teachings that have been known for centuries. Finally, I wanna close with some thoughts from Bradford Casberg, a member of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, in a 2021 article written for the National Audubon Society. Beyond recognizing indigenous stewards, land acknowledgements are about acknowledging the land. We are surrounded here in Silver City by a treasure of resources and natural beauty. From the waterways of the Gila and Membrus Rivers to the plains of the Chihuahuan Desert, to the Ponderosa Pine Forests and mountain ranges in the Gila Wilderness. So when we're out birding, he writes, Quote, it isn't just being thankful that a lifer appears, but also that the land can produce so much food and wonder where we work with it. These reflections, he reminds us, can bring to light the fact that people are not separate from nature, nor is the land they walk on separate from its history. So thank you, Heidi, for writing that. It's a really important, important thing to remember. And then... Um, I wanted to just um, remind us all of a few upcoming events. We've got um, several events coming up that you all have probably seen in email announcements or the Ravens newsletter or our website or Facebook. We're trying to get it out there. But Saturday, November 18th, Brian Dalton is leading a field trip to Lake Roberts. Um, that's I think if you want to carpool, you meet here at the Fine Arts Center parking lot, but those details are in emails and on the website. Uh, that's November 18th. December 3rd, he's also leading a field trip to Manga Springs. 
Um, that's for that nice mix of marsh and open field habitat that attracts quite a few interesting riparian species. Um, and then again, there's an option to carpool if you want to caravan out there. And Saturday, December 9th is Victorian Christmas. A few of us are gonna be doing some crafts for kids and adults alike. Um, so please stop by. Um, and then mid-December to mid-January, please consider joining one of these bird counts that are gonna be described tonight. So there's a lot of upcoming opportunities to get out there birding together, learning and um, contributing to citizen science. So I'll hand it off to Jackie, John and Linda for tonight. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So how many have done our bird counts here? Um, so quite a few. I, I can target one person for a new person to join the bird count. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, often there's been questions about and some confusion about which bird count is which. What, what do they do? So that's why we decided to put together this program tonight. And I'm Jackie Blurton, and our two uh, count organizers are uh, Linda Miller and uh, Linda Moore. I'm Linda, Linda, Linda Miller. <laughs> Linda, Linda Moore. And I have too many Lindas in life. Linda Moore, uniquely Linda Moore, and John Corey. And we have three uh, bird counts that we do annually. The Silver City Christmas Bird Count and the Gila River Christmas Bird Count are done for Audubon, and the Winter Raptor Survey is done for the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And just a brief history, the uh, Christmas bird count was begun in 1900 by ornithologist Dr. Frank M. Chapman. He proposed a bird census as an alternative to the traditional Christmas hunts in which uh, teams of uh, hunters would just shoot as many birds as they could on Christmas Day. So he proposed that people count birds instead of shooting them. And it was a successful campaign to raise awareness of the importance of birds in their conservation. Dr. Chapman attended Inglewood Academy and was curator of birds at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He fathered the Christmas bird count and also the early bird watching movement in the 1900s. But what a lot of people don't know is that he was also an exceptional photographer, an artist of birds, a writer, an author of books, and wrote the first field guides. And um, you, if you're interested, and I highly recommend a wonderful biography about him called Man Who Loved Birds by James of Hosta. And I just got that online, so it's easy to find. On Christmas Day in 1900, Dr. Chapman and 27 colleagues organized the bird counts in 25 locations, ranging from Toronto, Ontario to Pacific Grove, California. Today, there are 2,100 survey circles in the US and Canada, Latin America, the Caribbean, and all the counts are done between December 14th and January 5th. And each of these count circles are 15 miles in diameter. So everything is very consistent. And you can see our two counts right there down in the corner of New Mexico. I think New Mexico has about 30 count circles. So that's, uh, oh, here's all the counts. They also extend, of course, up into Alaska, way up into Canada, all through Central America, into South America, and, and uh, as well as the Caribbean into some of the Pacific Islands. So that's a lot of data collected by people like us who do the counts by our as citizen scientists. And uh, we're all volunteers. And the data collected in the CBC circles contributed to Audubon's 2014 climate change report, which predicted how climate would affect the, uh, the ranges of 588 North American bird species. The EPA included the CBC data as one of 26 indicators in their 
2012 climate change report. So we have, well, these are the two uh, Christmas bird count circles. The Gila River CDC is centered on the junction of Highway 180 and <clears throat> the Bill Evans Lake Road. And the Silver City bird count is centered on the golf course. And so John is going to describe the Silver City CDC circle for this. Thanks. Hello? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so, yeah, I've been the CBC compiler uh, for the Silver City count for three years. This will be my fourth year. Um, but the, the count itself has been going on a long time since actually 1957. And I believe Dale Zimmerman started it here. Looks like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it had to be him, exactly. <laughs> and so that, that's over 60 years of long-term data that we have about the birds in this area in uh, December. So let's see. Let's see what that means. Okay. Um, and so like how I decide when to have the count, it's you can't have any counts before December 14th. And so I pick the first Saturday after December 14th, unless it falls on December 14th. And there's 11 routes. Um, and there's two parts to the count. There is There are the routes and there's the feeder count. And as, as the compiler, I take all of the information that is uh, acquired during the counts and I compile it, I summarize it, and I send it off to the Audubon portal, and I send it to um, the state compiler, who is Christopher Rustay. Um, and so I'm just going to go over a quick overview here of the routes for the Silver City count. And so, like I said, there's 11 counts, and uh, the route one is uh, a count that um, Brian Dalton usually does or has for the last few years, and that includes Dragonfly, um, Crumb Road, Ridge, Ridge, or not Ridge Road, um, Racetrack Road. Um, uh, Route 2, it, uh, Karen Be Beckenbach has done that the last several years, and that includes Ridge Road south of the dump and along Tyrone Ridge Road up to Highway 90. Uh, Jackie does 2A, which is the dump, and that goes up along Ridge Road and a lot of the side roads up to the cemeteries on Cooper Street. Route 3 uh, is close to the, the hospital. There's a little area of Pino Saltos Creek and then along the bypass road up to Sanctuary and a little bit of um, Oxbow up there. Uh, Route 4, Bill Norris has done that for, I don't know how many years. Almost 20. Almost 20. Of them. Was, Maybe more than 20. He's been doing it since I've been the compiler, that's for sure. And that includes Cottage Sands, uh, Bear Mountain Road, a little bit of the CDT and Silver Creek, to name a few places. Route 5 is Little Walnut and some side roads up to Gomez Peak. Route six is south of Boston Hill, starting there at the truck bypass. It goes down to Tyrone and includes the Tyrone sewage ponds that are no longer there. Um, but I still see the bird lists from there, from, from Envious. Uh, uh, route seven is XYZ. It uh, goes down kind of west of racetrack over to Memory Lane and then all of the area south of there. Uh, route 8 is San Vicente, Route 9 is the golf course and uh, Mountain View Road, and then Route 10 is the route I've done the last couple of years, and that's Boston Hill, the Big Ditch, and Memory Lane Cemetery. And so you can see there's a lot of areas that, these, this is not an exact map, some of these areas are covered um, that are white, but there's a lot of area we can't get to that's either private land or has no road to access it. So 
Um, but if we, we get more participants in the future, it's possible we could split some of these routes or even maybe add some areas that we just didn't realize we had access to. So um, this is just the second, this is the second page. So with the feeder counts, and then I send this out with the route leaders. Um, so just to backtrack a little bit, but with the route section of the CBC, there is a route leader for each route and then volunteers, I can assign them to there. They can, the route leaders can also bring people on, but the route leader is kind of your, your bird expert for your route and they're familiar with all of the, the species in the area and they're gonna keep track of all of the birds that you see, but this is the document for at least for this count that we use. And it has all of the species that have been seen on the count for the last 60 plus years. And the main reason I put this up was there's a section at the end that sometimes doesn't get filled out. And I just wanna make sure everyone fills out all of the blank, blank spots at the end. It makes my job a lot easier, but uh, start and end time, very important. And then hours and miles, you need to split those up by like which hours were on foot, which hours were on in a car. Um, otherwise, I have to track you down or try to guess. <laughs> guess how long you're in a car. It's not very easy to do. So um, also with this sheet, I've, all of the areas that are all of the birds that are in bold or have an E or an F code. Those are rare species. Um, any bird that you have to add to the list is also a rare bird. And there is a rare bird form that you need to fill out. And as a compiler, I cannot, I can't send a species to the state compiler that does not have documentation. They won't accept it. So um, if you do see something interesting, make sure you record it on that form so that it doesn't, um, get taken off the list because I'd be ashamed. And so the second part is the feeder count. And since kind of the uh, COVID era, we have changed it a little bit. It's not only on the day of the count, it's also one day before and one day after. And so there's, there's three rules, big rules with the feeder count. And the first rule is I need to know how many hours have been spent counting. Um, the second rule is that um, if you're counting birds, say you, say you count three chickadees on your first day, and then the second day you see two chickadees, you can't add two to the three. It needs, it needs to be a high, high count only. And the third rule is that you can only you don't have to just count at a feeder, but you do have to stay on your property, and that's to prevent people from counting birds that were count counted during the route portion. And everyone is allowed to do either one of these or both. Um, and I really encourage anyone of any skill level to to join in, even if you don't know anything about birds and you just want to learn. This is a great opportunity to go out with local experts, and it's the easiest way to learn birds. It's from someone else, not from a book. So anyone that's interested, all skill levels are welcome. Um, just contact me uh, via email, and I can try to get you on a route or set you up with a feeder count. Um, this year, we might have one or two spots open for uh, a route leader. So if you feel comfortable with the birds around here, then uh, put that in your your uh, email to me. And just to, to wrap it up, uh, so we have this huge 62 year data set at this point uh, for birds in this area in December for this count. And it's multi-generational. It's data that you couldn't, one person could not just collect on their own. It's, it's a huge group effort. And so I'm just going to show you a few graphs of the species, these three species, actually, the dark-eyed junco, mountain bluebird, and the widgeon. And they all have very different graphs, almost like a blueprint of their um, 
what it's been like for them uh, numbers wise over the last 60 years. And so this is the dark eyed junco and you can see that it's kind of all over the place. It's got giant spikes, it's got huge valleys. So there's, there's times when it's super abundant and times when there's very few. And just this last year, we only had under 200, which seemed abysmally low, but as you can see, it's actually been worse a number of times. And that's kind of what this data set allows you to do is you can't just look at the species from year to year, you have to look at it uh, as a bigger picture. And potentially it, it is catastrophic, but time will tell. Um, but it, it's not unheard of for these species to, to have low numbers in the area. So you can see here and. In 1981, we had over 2,500, and then, yeah, 20, last year we had, I think we had like 180, so it, it varies widely. I think this year should be a lot better. I'm seeing a lot more of this year than last year. Uh, mountain bluebird is kind of like all or nothing, <laughs> so we've got all of these years where we have zero birds, and then other years where we have four or 500, even over 600. So that's that's a bird that seems to kind of have eruptions in this area. It shows up for reasons I don't know, but when it does, it's usually in large numbers. And then this one's very strange, the widgeon here. So it was essentially not recorded on the count for three quarters of its existence. And then all of a sudden in the early 90s, it showed up. And I thought maybe this had to do with the golf course and maybe someone here knows, but I read that the golf course was built in like 1963, but I don't know if it had water on it or not, but I was thinking maybe that correlated like in the early 90s, like they, they built some ponds there or something or <laughs> changed the grass or I don't know. But for whatever reason, in the early 90s, it just like spiked and they're, they've been around ever since and kind of dropped off a little lately, maybe due to drought. But so that's that's three completely different patterns you can use to from the data that was collected from this. And this is kind of just a couple more graphs. This is just a trend. These are the the total number of birds counted, and you can kind of see this upward trend, and that may have to do. It has to do with a lot of variables that maybe aren't accounted for in this graph, but um, a lot of that could be birding level and could be going to new areas that we didn't go to before and people just getting more experience and finding, finding birds that were harder to, to tease out before. But it, it's an upward trend, so it's, it's certainly not a bad thing. Then it would be far worse to see a downward trend. And this last graph here is just the total number of species uh, for each year. And basically since the 90s, we've kind of been averaging about low 80s for total species, but we've had some years like, I think it was 2019 or 20, yeah, 2019, we had 106. So we've had some years where we had over a hundred species and that also goes hand in hand with experienced people going out of their way to get that great horned owl or some other species because they got up at four in the morning. <laughs> but that is it for the Silver City count. Um, yeah, uh, please, I guess my email, is it gonna be up later? Yep. <laughs> okay, I'll hand this off to Linda. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't have pretty graphs like John did, <laughs> so you'll just have to bear with me. Um, this is the Gila River Christmas bird count circle. <clears throat> Excuse me, as Jackie said, it is centered at Bill Evans Lake Road and 180, and it encompasses the Gila River all the way down through the bird area and all of uh, Mangus Springs up through Cliff and Gila and almost a Mogollon box, but not quite. I inherited this CBC from Roland Shook back in 2019. And at that time we had um, six roots that were developed. And I'm gonna read some, some numbers here, but don't freak out because it's, it's just gonna be just a few. 
So in 2019, we had six routes and we had 1,655 individual birds at that time and 77 species. In 2020, there were eight routes with 4,566 and 101 species. So it went up pretty high there. 2021, there were nine routes with 3,456 individual birds counted and 105 species. So the individual number of birds went down, but the number of species went up. And in 2022, we had 10 routes, so I was expecting a whole lot more birds, but we did have 5,215 individual birds counted, but 92 species were counted. So my kind of thought of, you know, you get more routes and basically you get more birds, it's not exactly true because it is indeed a message of each individual count is variable and it is the trend that you're looking for. So, I never use a mouse, can you tell? Okay, there we go. So um, this count was started in 1972. I don't know who started it. Do you, Bill? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, it's been around most years since then. It um, is usually conducted the week between Christmas and New Year's, and it must be done by January 5th. I have this little black cloud over my head, unfortunately, when it comes to weather, which you don't seem to have. And, no, um, not some cold ones. Yeah, cold is fine, but yeah. you know, I I think the first year it was raining the day that we wanted to have it, so we kind of switched it to another day. And then I started saying, well, we'll have it on either this day or that day. And then last year it really got messed up because they had a weather forecast that said it was gonna be bad on Saturday, so we went switched to Sunday. But then the weather forecast changed, you know, as it does in this area, it switched to Sunday being really bad. So I'm thank you to past participants for putting up with me because I've just got this terrible old thing about weather over my head. But we're going to do the best that we can. This year, we're going to try for January, uh, December 30th, and uh, which is luck. Might be the 31st. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I'll do that. Um. Right now we have 10 routes with about 20 volunteers who run them. And there's a lot of private land out there which restricts access to the river and many of our routes. For example, last year of the 10 routes that we ran, six of them were on private land. And the ones that are on the Freeport land, um, you have to have permits in order to access that land. And those can be difficult to get. So that really restricts the number of people that we can have in that area, unfortunately. The good news is that we do have some routes that can still be modified to accompany, accompany to accomplish more volunteers. And um, um, we can certainly do that, especially around the bird area. There are places where we can divide that up and, and get more people in there. John was talking about the rear bird form, which may be required for some species. I'm gonna steal his check sheet <laughs> because I've always said, well, I don't know if it's a rare bird or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, I need to look that up and see how many um, species we have and make sure that people do realize what birds are rare. Uh, my bad, um, but certainly it's 10%. If the bird is not seen in 10% of the historic counts, and it is considered to be a rare bird. And whether it is a bird that's unusual for the area or just unusual for that time of year, um, it's still considered rare. So um, some of the interesting ones that we've had out there, um, the white-winged dove actually doesn't show up until, anybody guess what year white-winged dove showed up? We didn't have any at, at all until 1995, which I found was really astonishing. Um, and then it's been increasing ever since then, of course. So this might be an example of a bird that's actually um, increasing its range. It's something that researchers can take a look at the data and, and determine. Golden Crown Sparrow, um, we've only had four of those counted in the past, and John got one in 2020, I think it was. Yeah. And he did a great job of uh, being very good with his observation. And he actually had a photograph of it. And so it was certainly accepted. But he's correct that it can be sometimes a problem when you're trying to put a rare bird in there. The more notes that you can make on your observation, a photo if possible is really important or a recording of the vocal, um, whatever vocal they're doing. All that can help substantiate that sighting. And Brian Dalton actually had an American Dipper there in 2019 down along the Gila River. And that's the only one that's been seen in the count. And it actually was an eBird record for the area as well. Sandhill cranes, they're big, big birds, really hard to miss. They're very vocal and they're really, you know, they're out there. 
You can't miss them. And they have indeed been seen on every single count that we've done so far. Um, the lowest number of sandhill cranes we've ever seen is 32 that's been counted out there. The highest number is 463. So again, there's that big distinction between one count over another. You can't just look at one count, you have to look at the trend. Same is true with American Robin. The lowest number we've seen, you can believe it, was zero. How can you have zero robins in the winter around here? But there was a couple of years when you did. And then the highest number was 1,480. <laughs> so you can tell there's a whole lot of variety there. The trend is important, and you all help us with that whenever you're out there counting birds. And the winter raptor survey, moving on to that. Um, this encompasses a much larger area than our little Christmas bird counts, obviously. It goes from um, basically the Arizona border up by Mule Creek, all the way over to Alamogordo, and down through the Boot Hill to the border. So it's a really large area that we're dealing with. <coughs> Excuse me. I inherited the winter raptor survey from, again, Roland in uh, 2020 after it had lapsed for a year. And I was familiar with the Hawk Migration Association of North America from my work that I did with raptors on the East Coast. So I wanted to make sure that we were able to submit data to that particular organization because I knew they had this survey that they were running every year. So um, I contacted them. They didn't have anybody submitting from New Mexico. So they were thrilled to think that we might actually have some data for them. And we had to do a lot of changes on the survey in order to make sure that um, it, it was something that they could use for their data. So the survey is conducted every January over the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend. One of the changes that we had to make was when it was done because Roland used to run it the first part of December, but it's determined that there's still a lot of raptors that could be moving through the area at that time. But by January, they are on their winter territories. So that's why we chose that weekend. And the route can be run either on Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. Right now we have nine routes. There are about 18 volunteers who run them. And these routes are specified in data sent to Hamana, which is the Hawk Migration Association of North America. Uh, it was established in 1974 with a mission to advance scientific knowledge and promote the conservation of raptor populations through the study, enjoyment, and appreciation of raptor migration. They currently collect data from over 200 hawk watch sites, and that's where I was familiar with them from on the East Coast, as well as a winter raptor survey. It's established as a citizen science project to better understand a significant and understudied period in the life cycle of raptors. And that's specifically the winter raptor survey. Basically, they have a lot of data about hawks migrating through certain areas, but they didn't have much as far as what was going on with the birds that were actually wintering. So that's why they started this survey. <laughs> Excuse me. Hamana is a partner maintaining a raptor population index along with Hawk Watch International, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Association, and Birds Canada, a collaborative population monitoring program producing conservation assessments and scientifically defensible population trends derived from counts of migrating raptors. Specifically, that's saying that there's a certain amount of um, data that they need and it has to be collected in a scientific manner for them to be able to use it. And that means that with our nine routes, we need to have consistent annual coverage of those routes because that's essential to statistically valid trend assessment. So when I started working with Hamana and changing the um, winter raptor survey to make it to where we could actually give them data, uh, one of the things we had to do was map all the individual routes and make sure that people were consistent in running that same route every single year. Hamana then takes this data and is available for use for researchers by data release requests. They also have a, um, a yearly report that they will do, which tells you the results of all the winter raptor surveys. The nine routes in New Mexico are currently and still the only ones submitted from our state. And uh, another change that had to happen was the GPS coordinates at each sighting are essential. So if someone gives me some information about a route and they don't have GPS coordinates with it, I can't submit it to Hamana because you have to have that information. The attempt should be made to gather as much information as possible for each bird observed, including species, age, sex, whether it's flying, soaring, or perch. And all that information is on a check sheet that's available to be used. 
and habitat is an additional option for reporting. I know Brian Dalton and I have both tried this the last couple of years, and um, it's actually not too hard to do. For example, if you see a red-tailed hawk that's down by the river, you put down that it's in the riparian area. And if you see a red-tailed hawk that's down by the boot hill, it's probably in desert scrub area. And so it's really easy to make those quick observations right along with the other information that you're gathering. All, <clears throat> excuse me, all these are driving routes and tend to cover a great deal of distance. So they're very long days. You have definite eye strain at the end of that day, but um, it's certainly a lot of fun to go out and drive them and, and see the birds. Um, so let's take a quick look at where we have roots. This is Alamogordo. Uh, you might wonder, why do we have something in Alamogordo? Well, when we first started, when I first started taking over the program, I was working with our friends at uh, Messiah Valley Audubon, and they were doing some of the surveys along uh, around Las Cruces area. And we tried to coordinate getting those mapped and getting them to be consistent, but unfortunately it didn't work out very well. However, there was this one guy, Frank Wilson, and he was determined that he was gonna develop his own route and get the data that we could give to Hamana. And so that's what he's done. And this is his route. Excuse me. And he's run it for several years now. And uh, I'm a little jealous of him because he always gets Harris Hawk. In fact, last year he had two. And I have yet to get a Harris Hawk in any of my surveys. I love Harris Hawks. So that's Alamogordo. And then we have Deming Antelope Wells. This one starts at the City Rock Turnoff on 180. <clears throat> goes all the way down through Deming and then all the way down through the boot hill to the border at Antelope Wells. Um, this one, you'll get a good variety of birds usually. It kind of depends on the amount of rain we've had in the course of the year. It uh, can vary quite a bit, basically south of 10 in that respect. It's usually good for prairie falcon. In fact, last year it was the only route that produced a prairie falcon. And it's also usually good for a visit by the Border Patrol. <laughs> They're going to stop you and ask you what you're doing down there. <laughs> And this is Deming Hillsboro Hatch Raptor Count, which starts at Deming, goes all the way up through Lake Valley, up to Hillsboro, over to 25, down to Hatch, and then back over. Um, again, a good variety of birds is possible on this route. Last year, it had a high of 24 kestrels, and that was the high of any of the counts. And of course, American kestrel is basically, population has been decreasing for probably about 10 years or more now. No one's really quite sure why. So it's really good to see that many kestrels along that route. And here's the Hurley Lake Roberts, which Ken usually does. Uh, starts in Hurley, goes down to the City of Rocks turnoff, and then goes all the way up to Lake Roberts. He usually gets Golden Eagle along that first part where Thor used to hang out. Um, unfortunately, just because Thor's not with us any longer, the Golden Eagle, um, it's still good at Golden Eagle. Golden Eagle habitat, there's usually one hanging around down there. And then he can usually get bald eagles up at Lake Roberts. And Mangus Valley Mule Creek Raptor Count. This one, um, the map actually shows all the, well, for some reason, I don't know why it came out this way, but it actually shows all the points where raptors were seen. So you can see that you can get quite a few on some of these routes. Um, this one starts at Mangus Springs, goes all the way down. Uh, Bill Evans Lake Road to the all the way down the end of the bird area up through Cliff and Gila and then all the way out to the border at um, Mule Creek. This one last year had a high of 34 red tails for that count and that was the highest number of red tails counted on any of the counts and it's good for a variety of birds. You can get a lot of northern harriers on this one as well as kestrels and it's it's just really good route. And this was the newest route that we set up. It's a, it starts at Ridge Road, and it goes down to the airport through Whitewater and then over to White Signal. It's only been run for a couple of years now, so it's still a little, still not quite sure how good it is, but it is close to, close to Silver City and is the shortest route, so it doesn't take that long to run this one. Um, last year, there was good for a Cooper's Hug that was way down in Arroyo. Unfortunately, this road is very quiet, so you have plenty of time to pull out your scope and you can take time and look at it and try to determine what the bird is. Whereas if you're trying to do this on I-10, it's kind of impossible to do that. That's when you get the unidentified raptors a lot. 
And Red Forks, Cloverdale, Rodeo. This is the longest route. Brian Dalton usually runs this one. He starts at Road Forks, goes down through Rodeo, then all the way down to uh, Cloverdale and the Boot Hill, and then all the way back up to Lawrenceburg. He's got a place down there. I'm not sure where it is that he can get a white-tailed kite almost every year. And that's the only one that we usually see on the survey. But he also gets a good variety of birds <clears throat> here, although he does say that it's been decreasing in, in his mind for the last few years. But the trends can tell us that. And then Separ Playas Columbus, um, Bill usually runs this one. Um, unfortunately, last year, the little flat weather cloud over my head made it so that we had a lot of rain right before we uh, did the survey. And that section of road there was pretty much impassable, so it did not get run. But it's usually, it starts at White Signal, goes down through Separ, then down to Playas, and all the way over to Columbus. And it's usually good for Northern Harry as well as a lot of other different types of birds as well. And Silver City Red Rock, that's one that Jackie usually runs along with Jim. And um, it starts at Silver City, goes all the way down 90, all the way up to, uh, or all the way down almost to Lawrenceburg, then back up to Red Rock and back around again. And last year it produced two Merlins and they were the only ones that had any Merlins at all. And um, we also basically give a honorable mention to greater roadrunners and loggerhead strikes because they're kind of raptors. They do raptorial kind of things. <laughs> so historically we've counted them. Hamana unfortunately doesn't care. I mean, they, they probably care about them, but they don't care about that data. So um, but we still continue to count them. And again, we can see some trends falling with that. And that information goes to Audubon. Jackie, your turn. Um, this isn't citizen science. <laughs> what I liked about this cartoon was, was the eggs here. <laughs> so, um, uh, we do have a sign-up sheet here. If you'd like to do any of these other counts, if you have a count already and would like to do something in addition to it, especially the raptor count, those are really fun. Well, they're all fun. <laughs> Thanks, all Jackie. Great way to, yeah, they're all fun. It's a great way to spend the day with the rest yeah. count. Um, uh, so if you'd like to sign up for anything, come ahead and uh, come up and sign up on the sheet. It has, you can put your um, phone number and email and check off the count that you'd like to do. And John or Linda will call you on that. So is there any questions about the counts? I thought they presented some great information that we don't normally get to hear. And uh, so thank you guys. Um, so if you're on the Silver City uh, Christmas bird count, that same day on the 19th, we have our annual uh, CDC potluck at the um, Rolling Stones building on memory lane and even if you're not doing the count you're invited to come and and uh bring food and, mm -hmm. and enjoy um our reports from our uh surveys so i think that's probably it anything else we have to see that rain or the hell just here that counts that you got it <laughs> you got it yeah if 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 you can <laughs> Uh, if you're good at, at identifying bird calls, put that down. It's actually that makes and, a good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you make a good point about that because I'm um, certainly you hear birds and you may not be quite certain what it is. And there's this great little app called Merlin that everybody mm -hmm. tends to use. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine to use Merlin to try to under to try to get you know that bird into your head, but just be aware that Merlin is not always accurate and you need to basically see the bird or make sure that that is actually the bird that you're hearing before you just go, oh yeah, Merlin says it's this, because that's that's not going to be accepted. That's a good point. But if, if you happen to hear a whole bush full of white-crowned sparrows, 
you know, you can probably make an estimate on the sparrows because mm -hmm. they're pretty conspicuous in their colors. It's, it's a sparrow, I know. So, <laughs> so um, it, it just, either you use your best judgment on that, but uh, Merlin can often be wrong. Merlin can be wrong. So you need to really know your calls to be able to count that. But Great Horned Owl is a good one. <laughs> uh, anything else? I just like to encourage everyone who has been leading any any of these routes, any of these bird counts for a number of years. When folks move to town, um, to be open about, I'm sure you will be uh, inviting new residents of Silver City to join you uh, on these bird bird uh, these censuses because um, you're really gonna it's really encourage membership and participation. In Audubon a couple of years ago, if you've been out with Susan and Bert Middlestadt. They just moved to town. They were looking to tag them. Nobody knew who they were. And I had, they came along with me on the Gila River Town. They were really good. and become a real active member of our birding community here. So if you've been running a count for many, many years and someone approaches you, can I tag along with you? I might consider it. I just want to yeah. share that. A absolutely. Newcomers are uh, welcomed and People who just want to learn more about birds and birding are welcome too. You don't have to be an expert to join a count because the count, the route leaders are are your experts. You know, we know our routes, we know our birds pretty much. I am not a bird expert. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting there. Yeah, perfectly clear. I am not an expert, but I love going out there and doing my best. And you know, that's really the whole idea. There may be some little brown birds that I'm not going to be able to identify, but you know, I, that's fine. It's it's okay. And, and that's why there are several people on the count, is that exactly. when you put your heads together, you can you can usually come up with the bird. Well, I have to follow up. I think once yes. Linda came along with Roland Shook, I may mean, rest in peace, and myself on a hot count. And you were seeing all kinds of stuff that uh, we weren't seeing. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, we're not seeing this stuff. Well, Linda's finding all this stuff. So I also like that something that John said. We all started off as beginners. And the best way to begin to learn how to identify birds, learn about them, to go up with somebody who knows a lot about them. And I find that to be very, very true. So be open to yeah. Uh, absolutely. Every, everybody is welcomed and we can coach them through. And uh, on our route, I like to have four people because then we have a driver, we have someone to record and we have two people to look out either side of the car. And, um, you know, we have put together some really good teams. Thanks, Bill. That's that's uh, comments are greatly appreciated because we do want to be open to everybody and we want new people to introduce them not well to the birds, to the area. Is there anything else? Great presentation. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you guys. Thanks, everybody.